things that he says. But Angie Machado now joins us, 247 Sports and covers Oregon State. Well, you have had, had nothing on your plate lately at all involving Oregon State football. Nothing, nothing at all. And, and gosh, I mean, huge, huge weekend for Oregon State. Actually, two huge weekends coming up for Oregon State uh, with Washington this week and, and then Oregon next week. But um, this whole realignment, yeah, it's keeping me busy. Let's start with the latest legal thing, the injunction. So right now it kind of is back on hold or whatever. But Angie, in the end, what do you think really, if Oregon State and Washington State do get a chance to make the decisions by themselves, and maybe they do, what do they really want to do here? Because they're not going to just say, hey, you split $200 million and we split $200 million. Yeah, no, I mean, they, what they're saying is that they want to, um, you know, create and, and rebuild the Pac-12, Pac-10 conference. So um, what that looks like down the road, I, I think, is kind of still up in the air somewhat. But, you know, I think when you when you look at it, I mean, this whole realignment thing is not done. Um, I mean, we know the ACC is potentially going to, um, you know, look different in a couple of years if, SEC and Big Ten can can make make their way in there. So, um, you know, I think what Oregon State and Washington State are looking to do is somehow create some stability for the next two years, have some type of a schedule in place, and then you know look to rebuild from there. So, um, you know, the narrative today has been all over the uh, scheduling alliance with the Mountain West, which my sources are telling is not the the first plan of attack. I mean, that would be down the list, kind of a, a last resort. So. Um, you know, will Oregon State play Mountain West teams in the next two years? Absolutely. But um, from what I'm hearing, the schedule would look more like five Power Four teams, five or you know, six G5 teams, and then um, you know they already have Idaho State on the schedule, so an FCS school. So they would kind of be adopting them in Washington State like the BYU scheduling model. They just have to do it really fast. Yeah. So it'd be an independent. I mean, if you look out there, there's a lot of schools with some with some openings. So it's not. It would not be impossible to do. It would take some, you know, maneuvering. But yeah, work as an independent, and this is what Oregon State coaches have been telling commits as well. The football coaches have been telling commits that no, they're not going down and playing, or you know, not becoming Mountain West. So, you know, a scheduling alliance a couple a couple weeks ago, I know Mountain West was saying if there was a scheduling alliance in place, it would be, um, you know, a scheduling alliance with the thought that Oregon State and Washington State would absorb the Mountain West, the entirety of the Mountain West, in two years. Um, that doesn't make any sense for Oregon State There's in Washington State. There's no need to take all those schools. In two years' time, the Mountain West TV contract is up and the buyouts are off. So I could see that being a time when Oregon State and Washington, Washington State could go out, pick and choose who they want. Um, you know, and it makes sense to bring in a San Diego State, um, a Fresno, Boise, UNLV, um, but they don't need to go out and get, you know, Utah State, New Mexico, all of those programs. So um, a lot on, on the table. And, I, you know, I think if if some, if it's just a, hey, we're going to play some games together, that's one thing. But a, an actual alliance that would lead to a, quote, unquote, reverse merger um, would be a bad scenario for Oregon State and Washington State. Angie, I've been able to see a little bit just thanks to social media. But uh, how would you describe the way that Oregon State faithful have been able to both uh, balance the enjoyment of what is a really fun football season and a really exciting last couple of weeks, but also the uncertainty of the future. Is it made for just kind of an interesting stew of emotions uh, for this football year? Yeah, you know, I, in August it was bad. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. It was kind of a downer um, when all this kind of happened and everything kind of fell apart. Um, but I will say that, you know, things have kind of picked up. I, I think, you know, the, the team, Coach Smith uh, and fans have all just said, okay, let's enjoy what we have. Now, this week it is. I, I, I can sense even on our message board in the lodge at Beaver Blitz, there's some bittersweet, you know, like, hey, this could be the last Pac-12 as we know it game at Research Stadium. So, um, you know, a little it's senior night. Um, it's it's going to be a, a big, big game. But, um, you know, now it's kind of moving forward to, okay, how do we how does Oregon State and Washington State move forward um, and, you know, kind of hold, hold steady for two years um, before trying to, either, you know, completely rebuild the pac Pac-10, Pac-12, or, um, you know, move into another conference. There were people or players that everyone thought might be the stars for Oregon State, and a lot of them, most of them, have done exactly what expected. Are there a couple of unsung players, Angie, you'd like to bring up that perhaps have outperformed or played much better than anyone thought and have been a difference? Yeah, you know, I, I think going into the season, everybody expected, you know, Texas native Damian Martinez to, 
to be a star, and, and he has. He hit his 1,000-yard rushing mark just last week. Um, DJ Uwangalale at quarterback, transferred in from Clemson, has has really elevated that position for the Beavs. And, you know, that was kind of a you – know, we, we all said last year Oregon State won 10 games, but um, they were a good quarterback away from maybe winning 11 or 12. So um, those two are, are kind of what was expected. You know, the offensive line has been really strong for the Beavers, which was expected. I, I don't think anybody saw – right tackle Tali Fuaga really kind of being the guy. I mean, he's like shot up the draft boards. Last I saw was first round seventh overall pick. Um, so he's really, really, you know, kind of elevated his game. Joshua Gray at left tackle. But looking on the defense, you know, you look at a guy like Andrew Chatfield, who transferred to Oregon State from Florida two years ago. He's really emerged um, as a guy. Katano Ladapo, a, a senior safety started as a walk-on and, and again he had his first two interceptions of the season just last week so a couple guys really stepping up for Oregon State um, Jack Velling a tight end um, eight touchdowns on the year for him so um, he's right in the mix of some of the top tight ends in the country. Angie Jonathan Smith is one of the best young coaches in the country a uh, highly thought of all over the place uh, the, the secret's kind of out now on how good he is uh, he is an alum um, you know so Again, it would it would be harder to tear him away. But is there some nervousness around Corvallis about him leaving because of the uncertain future of where their conference affiliation lies? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's he's here. I, mean, I think he's at Oregon State. I, he has a young family. I think his his oldest is a sophomore in high school and entrenched in sports. So, um, you know, that's that's part of it. His, you know, he is a beef. Like you know, like you mentioned, he was the best quarterback in Oregon State's history, really. I mean, aside from Terry Baker, more recent history, I should say. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think if, if the uncertainty is there. If, if Oregon State's going to get you know, relegated to a Mountain West-type level, absolutely I could see some movement. Uh, he has been in discussions, I've been told, um, with the AD, and he knows exactly the plan. He knows exactly what the, the plan is going forward. Um, and apparently, you know, the, the plan is to have – Something announced, schedule, and, and everything wise here the first part of December before the transfer portal, before um, signing day. So that's kind of the, the drop dead date. Um, but yes, he's being, you know, thought of many job openings. I've, I've heard of some other job openings that are not quite open yet that there's speculation on, but um, all indications is that he will be in Corvallis. And um, like I said, I this, this, that's why this uncertainty and why finding a great, a good schedule and a workable path forward that is not merging with the Mountain West is so imperative to to the future of Oregon State and Washington State. Angie, a uh, lot going on. Wow, uh, off the field, but uh, on the field as well as we've kind of touched on, and and nowhere uh, nowhere easier to look right now than than coming up this Saturday. I mean, what a game in store! And right now, Oregon State slight favorites uh, at home. They've been very, very good there. Why have they been so good at Research Stadium? And what are your thoughts on? this matchup and the fact that uh, at least Vegas thinks that the, the bees are slight favorites here. Yeah. You know, that, that line opened uh, Washington state, I think was a two and a half to three point favorite on Monday when it opened. So um, money is shifting over to the Beavers way. Oregon state has lost one game. They're 16 and one at home over the past three seasons. So, uh, and that was a three point loss to USC last year. So this is a team that plays, like you said, very strong at home. The crowd is going to be crazy. Um, I can't even explain how crazy I expect <laughs> this fan base to be. Student tickets, six thousand student tickets were gone within twenty minutes today when they when they went on online to, to be picked up. Uh, standing room only. They had to go to the fire marshal to uh, in, expand the standing room only tickets. This is going to be a crazy crowd. It's going to be loud. Um, so you know, I do. I expect some false starts. Uh, that's you know, kind of the mo when when you're playing at home at research. It's, it's going to cause some some uh, sound issues for the visiting team. Washington's is an interesting one. I, I think. You know, I, first of the season, beginning of the season, I said they were the most talented team in the Pac-12. I had them number one. I still think they're super talented, but they're starting to show some cheeks there, um, some close wins, close close kind of eking out some wins against some not great opponents. So um, the weather is supposed to be an issue. Um, each day that goes by, it gets rainier and rain, rainier in the forecast. So um, I do think that can bode well for Oregon State and the fact that Oregon State's run game is better than the Washington Huskies. So um Penix, though, Michael Penix is such a talent. The wide receivers are so talented. 
that defense is going to have to put some pressure on him and, and hopefully force him into some bad decisions. How much does this get amped up in the next two weeks? I mean, obviously they're on the road next week, but uh, that they could play the ultimate, not only play the ultimate spoiler, but also wind up in the championship game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what's kind of fun about all this. Is it's not just, hey, Oregon State could spoil two big Northwest rivals. It's they could spoil, but also find themselves in the Pac-12 championship game. So, um, and I think that's the way that Coach Smith is, is handling this. It's not about ruining someone else's day. It's about playing for, for their own um, goals. And yeah, Washington, Oregon's looking tough. So Civil War down in Eugene next week is, is going to be a good one as well. So um, it's there's a lot on the line. And, and you know, that's, that's one of the areas I think Coach Smith does such a good job is kind of sometimes he seems very emotionless, but he's able to keep the, the team not too high and not too low. And uh, that could, could help the bees a lot going forward in the next two weeks with, with all the pressure. Can you please paint a picture of Corvallis and what that scene will be like on Saturday? <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be crazy. So um, or, Oregon State just opened up the new side of Research Stadium, a complete rebuild. So um, that stadium, it's, it's built – I, I've been around the program a long time. So back in the you know 2000s, before they did the other, the old new side, I guess, um, that opened in 2005, um, Dennis Erickson was actually very involved in the design process of the stadium. And, and one of his big things was to keep the stadium close to the field and make it real up and down so that the sound really rained down on the, on the field. And that's really what they took to heart. So that it's going to be loud. It's going to be, you know, the students go sideline to sideline or end zone to end zone behind the, the home team. So um, they are right there in the middle of the action. And uh, it's going to be, it'll be a rowdy crowd. That's, that's for sure. 430 kickoff. So uh, on ABC, that gives the, the co-eds plenty of time to, to pre-funk and tailgate. And mm-hmm. uh, it will be a, it'll be a, a fun, fun crowd. Angie, thank you very much for the knowledge on Oregon State in many different ways and uh, continued luck in covering so many different angles of not just football but everything else, legal, uh, realignment, uh, whatever else you want to call it or what happens with Oregon State and Washington State. And good luck this weekend. Thanks for your time. Hey, thank you guys for having me. All right. Angie Machado, 247 Sports on Oregon State. Yeah, I didn't think about the – I mean, the schedule.